Um, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, depending on where you're joining from. Um, sorry about the slight delay there. A uh, few technical hitches, had to do a last minute machine swap, um, but we got it, got there in the end. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, the summer 22 webinar of the uh, Bright of the Salesforce release presented by BrightGen. Um, you've got me flying solo for only the second time in a decade today. Uh, as Clive Platt has now entered his re well earned retirement, um, so it'll be me going forward for the foreseeable future. Um, so, this is what we're going to be uh, covering today. Um, if you have any questions, post them in the chat and I'll do my best to answer them at the end. And if I can't, um, I'll arrange for either myself or someone to get back to you and to uh, give you an answer. So, our first topic is fond farewells as we wave goodbye to features that have been put out to pasture. Um, legacy API versions 7 through 20. So we've been talking about these for um, a couple of releases now. Um, they are now retired as of summer 22, so they will error. If you've got anything connecting to those, it'll start erroring as of when the release goes live, either this weekend or next weekend. Um, <clears throat> in a similar vein, versions 21 to 30 are now deprecated. They are no longer supported. And in a year's time for the summer 23 release, around a year's time anyway, um, these will start to error as well. So if you've got any that are, any integrations running on API versions 21 to 30, then please get those updated. And also Salesforce for Outlook is scheduled for retirement in June of 2024. So it's two years away, you've still got plenty of time. Um, but the recommendation is to move to Outlook integration and Einstein activity capture, which is a lot more functional. Okay, next we have some general updates. Um, starting as usual with the supported browsers, so I won't read through all of these, um, but you can see the, the pattern, which is the same as usual. The latest stable Edge, Edge Chromium, Firefox and Safari, apart from Classic, which still has IE11 hanging on, um, and CRM Analytics, formerly Einstein Analytics, which doesn't support Safari. Uh, you can find all of the uh, supported browsers at the short link shown there. As usual, we'll be sharing the deck after this, so don't worry about capturing these short links. Um, Einstein search, uh, it's a next general topic. So this now allows you to view your searchable objects and fields. So go to set up Einstein, Einstein search, search manager and look for the tick in the searchable column. If there isn't a tick there, it isn't searchable. Uh, a bit more on Einstein. You can now use uh, natural language search on knowledge articles. So just by typing in a query like knowledge articles created today, that will give you that information. Um, if you opt into Einstein data exploration consent, apparently this will allow Salesforce data scientists to e explore and improve your data, um, whatever that means. I can understand the explore, I'm not sure what the Im improving does, but hey ho, I guess we'll find out. Um, and also search layouts in Salesforce Classic has now been renamed to list view button layout. Hopefully not too many people are still configuring page layouts in Classic anyway. Uh, moving on to analytics, the enhanced report type selector is generally available, which looks very nice. Um, so as well as the uh, existing groups that you can see in terms of things like accounts and contacts, opportunity, customer support reports, etc. Um, you can also see the recently used types. So if you're regularly creating reports of a particular type, those will appear in there. Um, and also when you click on a report type uh, name, so accounts in this case, that will show you more information about this, including the objects that are used in that report type. Uh, another nice feature around analytics, you can now edit multiple fields in the report run page. Um, not every field is editable, so you need to look for this pencil icon. So in this case, the stage is editable um, when you hover over a field, um, but it could be something like created date isn't editable in that particular way. So it'll have a lock icon next to it. Um, but basically what this allows you to do is edit multiple columns across multiple rows, so almost treating it like a spreadsheet, um, and saving that in a single button click. Um, so until you click save, nothing changes, it's all in the UI. Um, and also, uh, if you don't want your users doing this kind of consolidated editing, you think maybe that's giving them a little bit too much um, option to change things, you can opt out. Uh, report summaries now support median, which gives you the midpoint of a range, um, and allows you to remove the influence of extreme values. Uh, 
And finally, for uh, analytics, you can now limit the number of rows returned in a tabular report. So if you're only interested in 10 rows, you don't have to process all however many thousand there are and just ignore the rest of them. You can tell it you only want 10 rows returned. So it should speed up a few things, I would imagine. Um, moving on to customization, one of my preferred areas. Um, some enhancements to restriction rules, which were launched in the last release and allow you to basically narrow the availability, of narrow the sharing effectively, um, limit it rather than just opening up as we always used to be able to. Um, external objects are now supported uh, in restriction rules. Um, and also restriction rules used to stop you creating or editing a record if it meant that you wouldn't be able to access that record as soon as you created it. Um, Whereas now it will allow you to do that, it'll allow you to create it or change the um, characteristics of a record so that it matches a restriction rule criteria. Just be aware that if you do that, once you save it, you may no longer have any access to it. Um, users with view all um, and modify all on an object can now access records even if there are restriction rules that would normally block them, um, which gives feature parity with view modify all data, which can always see all records. Um, and finally, on restriction rules, the criteria now supports pick lists, although that doesn't include multi-select pick lists, which is probably not a bad thing. Um, if you have custom pick list fields, this is probably something for the uh, more mature orgs, I would say. If you've got custom pick list fields where you've got more than 4,000 inactive um, values, you can uh, basically view what those are rather than having to go through and figure them out yourself i'm not sure where 4000 come from that must be some kind of um performance impact there what you can do if you think you're in that situation you can ask for an email um and you'll you'll basically um, get emailed with what needs to uh which ones need to be looked at um and something that's probably going to be of use to everyone rather than just those in the more mature orgs um if you add pick list values that are duplicates you'll now be told what the duplicates are, whereas before you just got told there are some duplicates in those values and you had to go and figure it out for yourself. So now you know which ones you've already got, which is nice. Um, I think this late, this next one is a very cool feature, um, dynamic related lists. These are generally available now. Um, and this allows you to manage related lists directly in the Lightning App Builder rather than always having to switch back to the page layout editor. So it gets you away from another classic aspect. Um, also, uh, you can create um, up to two lists um, with the same relationship, but using different filters. Um, and I'll, I'll show some screenshots from that in a moment. Um, so you use the new dynamic related list hyphen single component for this, which appears in the list of components in the app builder. Um, and when you drop that into the page, you'll be asked to provide a bunch of information, uh, including at the bottom, any filter criteria. Um, so in this case, I've named the list view small opportunities um, and I've set the filter on the amount as being less than 500,000. Um, what I haven't shown here is I've got another list view because you're allowed up to two and I've called that big opportunities and that is for those with an amount of 500,000 or greater. And this is what it looks like on the screen. So this is my GenePoint account. You can see at the top where partners and approval history are. Um, that's the regular group of related lists that have come from the page layout editor. Um, but below that are the two dynamic related lists that I put in. Small opportunities, so I've got two of those, one at 90,000, one at 200,000, and then big opportunities where I've got one at 750,000 um, and one at two and a half million. Um, so if you do need to think of some of these um, related records in slightly different ways, uh, this is a, a nice mechanism that allows you to do that and also allows you to break them up so you don't necessarily have to see thousands in a single list view, although obviously you'll still see quite a few in each of the two because you can't break it up that much. Um, and finally, for customization, you can now set expiration dates for permission sets and permission set groups. Uh, you need to be using the enhanced user interface and you do need to enable the release update in order to allow that to happen. Moving on to our next topic, my personal favorite, development. Um, so Lightning Web Components now support the Light DOM, um, also known as the DOM. So basically, the way Lightning components usually work is they have their own shadow DOM and that hides the component markup and the styling, etc., from the rest of the page. So it kind of almost detaches it and puts it into a private space. Um, but there are times where you really want to not do that. You want to attach directly and let other elements have access, particularly if you're using third party uh, libraries. Um, it also allows the styling to filter down, whereas at the moment, global styling will stop at the shadow DOM boundary, whereas if you're using light DOM, it'll go all the way through to the component. 
Um, you can use Light and Shadow DOM interchangeably, um, but bear in mind this isn't available for the Salesforce supplied base components, which are in the Lightning hyphen namespace. And you enable Light DOM for a component um, either in JavaScript using the render mode static field as shown in the first code snippet, or in the HTML markup via the LWC colon render mode template attribute light or shadow. Um, something else um, I'm really pleased to see, it's been a good, re good release for me. Um, the various web dialogue modals like prompt confirm, so where you've had web, web pages will pop up, are you sure you wanna do this, hit yes, or um, you're about to submit this, okay or cancel. Um, we've typically either had to use the vanilla ones that come with the browser, which don't look great, or roll our own for lightning styling. Um, whereas now these are available as native lightning and aura components. So this has been done to work around the end of cross origin support for web dialogues from embedded iframes. So basically what would happen there, um, and I think this is something that impacts the Salesforce setup pages, for example, is that if the uh, the detail of the page is an iframe um, pulled in from another site, if that wanted to put an alert up, because alerts block, um, the standard uh, browser alerts block the user from doing anything, um, that's no longer gonna be, a, gonna be allowed. If you're an embedded frame, you can't take over the whole browser window. So that's gonna stop at some point in time. Um, so this basically is a way of allowing us to continue that kind of functionality and behavior. Although something to note is that they don't block in the, um, in the Lightning Web Component and Aura side of things. Um, you create these via JavaScript, you can't create them declaratively via HTML, um, and they are asynchronous, so you'll either need an async function or you'll need to handle promises in there. Um, Performance Assistant, this is a new feature providing information and resources around scalability, so something that's very important to consider for any application that will be around for more than a few months. The um, assistant is divided into three sections. There's learn, where you learn about the basics of scalability and performance testing. Uh, prepare, where you create your strategy, your test plan, you schedule your performance test. And analyze and optimize, where you interpret the results, identify any issues and fix them. All sounds very easy, doesn't it? A um, Couple of other changes on the coding side of things. Um, so Apex tests should run faster on sandboxes, basically because controls have been put in place to stop somebody else taking all the, consuming all the resources of the, uh, of the pod that are available for unit tests. So if there, were, if there were some highly concurrent test executions, so lots of tests running at the same time within a single instance, that could consume more than its fair share of resources um, and could start impacting other tenants, other residents of the pod. Um, so that should be fair, fairer going through, whether you notice it or not is another matter, but it will be fairer under the hood. Um, and finally, you can group multiple platform events into a single channel. Um, sadly, this is only the Comet D streaming API clients, um, but hopefully that's at the moment, um, and hopefully they will um, be available for the other areas that platform events are used, because having to set up a, a new channel every time you want a different platform event can be a bit time consuming. Okay, moving on to experiences. Um, you can now create multilingual Lightning Web runtime sites and supporting up to 20 languages per site. So for standard components, all text entry fields uh, are translatable. And for your custom components, you can mark the string properties as translatable if you want to make those available for translation. Um, and also the language will be determined from the user's browser settings going forward. Um, previously, regardless of their browser settings, they saw the site in the default language, which doesn't sound like a great experience at all to me. So that's a nice feature to be added. Um, experience cloud components have had some attention. Um, users can now deactivate their account from Aura sites um, using the customizable user settings component, but you do need to enable this. You need to enable user self deactivate in user management settings. Um, you can now add page and content links to content and layout components. You were always, always able to add URLs, but now you can add, um, as I say, uh, page and content links there. Um, and flows are now available in Lightning Web Runtime sites. Um, they can't contain Aura components because Lightning Web Runtime only works with pure Lightning Web component sites. Um, and continuing on the developer side of things, you can now toggle the locker service on or off 
for Aura and LWC sites by setting the is locker service enabled attribute in the main page.json uh, configuration metadata file. Um, so you don't need to have to worry about it at an individual component level. You can turn it on or off for everything. It applies to both Aura and LWR. Um, and for Aura sites, where you have URL query parameters that are optional, as in the user may not provide them, um, what used to happen was if you had an expression such as record ID, shown here, um, brace, exclamation mark, record ID, close brace, um, that turned into that string literal rather than being an empty string, which was really unhelpful. Um, so now that will evaluate to an empty string if it's missing, rather than giving you the string literal of something that should have been replaced. Um, the campaign against guest users continues in this release. Um, it'll now be removed from any permission set and permission set groups associated with permission set licenses, where view or modify all permission is granted or edit and delete or delete standard objects is granted because guest users aren't allowed those permissions. So rather than them just not applying, the guest user will be booted from that along with all the other per permissions that would be in that set and group. So they can suddenly lose a lot that you weren't expecting. The permission set license is not removed, um, but everything else, can, everything conferred on the guest user by the permission set will be. Um, this applies to Aura, Lightning Web, Runtime and Visual Force sites. Um, it's a release update that will be enforced in the next release in winter 23, but if you think you might be impacted, you probably want to test this in a sandbox as soon as you can. The generic run flows permission is also being removed for guest users. Uh, I think this is a good thing, actually. I don't think this is a bad thing at all, because it means that rather than giving guest users access to everything, you'll explicitly grant them access to particular flows via profiles or permission sets, which seems like a, a, lot, a lot more controllable to me, uh, much better granular security. Um, again, this applies to Aura, Lightning Web Runtime and Visual Force sites. Um, and this is a release update that will be enforced in spring 23. Uh, but you can move to it sooner rather than later by changing the access settings on each flow to use profiles, permission sets, as I've shown in the screen grab here. So I definitely recommend doing that just to give you full control, make sure flows don't leak out to the guest user. Uh, next topic, sales cloud enhancements. Um, starting off with collaborative forecasting, uh, you can now change the label of a forecast category that includes more than one forecast. Um, previously, that forecast category rather. Previously, this only worked for single category roll-ups. Now you can do it for those that contain more than one. Um, and you can create custom filters using standard number, currency, and pick list fields, as shown in the screen grab there. Note that you can't filter on custom fields. It's only the Salesforce provided ones. Um, and you can now view corporate and forecast currency units in a single view. Um, the corporate currency is the one in brackets uh, shown after the, uh, the forecast currency. And Einstein Deal Insights now includes recommended actions. So in this screen grab, the recommendation is more engagement, which feels like a fairly easy one to, uh, to go with. But basically, yeah, it can give you some information about how the whim rates were affected with additional engagement as well. Uh, you can now use existing org-wide email addresses also as the default no reply address rather than having to create a separate one. Um, and there's a bit of a change around um, email, unverified email addresses. So again, this is something for the, the more mature orgs. Um, you, at one point in time, you didn't have to verify an email address in order to be able to use it within Salesforce. Um, going forward, if you try, when, when it gets to summer 23, if you try and send an email, um, from an unverified address, you won't be able to. You'll get an email asking you to verify it, and until you do that, your emails will be blocked. Um, it doesn't take two minutes to verify, so it won't be an issue. It just might catch you by surprise if you're in a, mature, a more mature org. Um, overdue tasks now appear in red on the activity light timeline, the task list view, the task detail view, task Kanban view, and the task split view. So pretty much everywhere you can see tasks, if it's overdue, it'll appear in red, reminding you that you've missed something. Um, and if you're using Einstein Activity Capture, and that has automatically associated an activity but hasn't got it quite right, um, you can now update that. So you can remove some or all of the associations. You can associate it with additional records or different records. So you're now in control of that. 
Um, and a few features that were previously add-ons have now been rolled into performance and unlimited edition. Um, I won't read the list here, but as you can see, there are a few of them. And a couple of other sales cloud enhancements. Uh, you can now enable person accounts without contacting Salesforce support. Um, as long as you have at least one record type, one account record type, um, you, you have um, profiles that have read on accounts, also have read on contacts, and the org wide default for um, contact is either controlled by parent or account and contact have an org wide default of private. Um, essentially, because person accounts combine an account and a contact, you must make sure your users can access both parts of that. So that's what will be um, confirmed. Um, again, it, you, whether you should enable person accounts just because it's easier doesn't mean you should do it. Always test it in a sandbox. Person accounts, they get a bad rep from time to time. Um, they do have their uses, um, but it should always be a, a considered decision before enabling them. You can't turn them off. You don't have to use them once they're there, but they will be enabled going forward. Um, and, and another holdout of uh, feature parity from Salesforce Classic has been mopped up in this release, the ability to manually share campaign records with another user. Next, we have Service Cloud, starting with routing. Uh, you can check availability before you route work to uh, a group of agents based on the number of agents, the backlog of work. Uh, make sure you don't overload everybody. Um, you can configure a custom sound to play when work item is assigned, maybe a sad trombone for someone who thinks they might have been done with everything. Um, and you can also configure auto acceptance of work items at the uh, channel level, although how your agents would feel about that, I don't know. Um, and on the Einstein front, uh, there's another 16 languages available to chain, train reply recommendations in. And there's also a create article recommendations action, which is now available for Flow. Uh, if you're using entitlements, the milestone timer now automatically stops when the case exits the process. Previously, it wouldn't stop and you had to manually click the is stopped button, uh, but there is no need to do that now. It will figure it out for you. Um, and there's a, now a messaging learning map that guides you through planning, creating, customizing, monitoring, messaging channels. Um, there's a wealth of information there, nicely organized. Um, I'm hoping we'll be seeing more of these uh, around the Salesforce, uh, various Salesforce areas of functionality and you can find that learning map at the short link shown. Uh, bots, um, the conversation canvas has been enhanced. You can now drag and drop from the component library and also you can drag to rearrange the bot steps. So a little bit easier to tweak and change your bots. Um, there's also some improvements around the standard reports. There's 16 new standard reports and some updates to existing ones. Um, rather than overwriting the ones you've got in place, these are a new folder named Einstein Bot Reports Summer 22. Um, so if you want to use those, you'll have to go and find them there. Which brings us to the end of the generally available features. Um, so now we're going to look at some beta features. As always, caveat emptor, beta features may not go live. Um, you have to agree to um, a different licensing approach for those. So make sure you read it and understand the impact of it. Um, first up, filtering report types for selected objects. So rather than having to wade through all the different report types and figure out if it actually supports the various objects that you want in there, does it have the right relationships, etc. Um, you can uh, just you can just basically just filter on those. Just type in some uh, ex some Salesforce object names, um, and that will restrict the list to those that support those particular objects. So should allow you to drill into your report types, uh, the report type you need a bit quicker. Um, next up, this is something that I've been wanting since I started using Salesforce back in 2008. Custom address fields. So I don't have to handcraft solutions of multiple additional address fields that don't really work well together and I have to manually um, organize them in a particular way. Um, so in order to use this, you must have state and country pick lists enabled and you need to turn it on in setup user interface. Um, once that's done, you'll have a new custom field type of address, a compound field. Um, so I've added a compound field of address named physical location into my webinar records. And as you can see, that appears nicely in a group. Physical location was the name I gave it. And then in brackets after each of them, you can see they're tied to physical location, uh, but then you can see what the actual component is. 
Um, I honestly, I've lost count of the amount of times I've implemented custom address fields or custom address objects um, in the past. So really very pleased and hoping to see this go generally available as soon as possible. Um, Picklists have had a bit, bit of love this release, um, both in the generally available and the beta side of things. So if a field has a lot of pick list, uh, inactive pick list values and you haven't used those on any records, so if they're inactive and they're used on records, there's not much you can do because you need them there. But if you've got inactive ones that aren't used anywhere and you've got a lot of them, you can clean them up in a single operation. So you have to enable this through setup pick list um, settings. And again, you're opting into the beta, beta feature, subject to the terms of the Unified Pilot Research That's Agreement. I will, I'll just have to leave the webinar. Um, I think it should be fine. I will leave the webinar. All good. I'll just let. Right, sorry about that. Just a bit of background noise there. Um, yeah, so once you have um, opted into this, uh, basically on any pick list custom field, um, you will then see a delete unused values button. Um, that fires off a background task and you receive an email when it has completed. Um, doesn't take very long at all if you've only got a few like I had, I only had three. If you've got 4,000 as shown earlier in the webinar, um, that might take you a little bit longer, I guess. Um, and finishing up on a developer focused uh, beta feature, user mode database operations. Um, so a bit of background for those that aren't Apex developers. Um, Apex code executes in system mode most of the time, um, and that means things like field level security, object permissions, and the individual user's permissions are disregarded. Um, and a lot of the time you want that. If you've got a trigger which needs to update a field because something has happened, um, it, doesn't, it shouldn't matter necessarily whether the individual user has access to update that field manually, your automation needs to do that. However, in many other cases, you should be respecting the security configuration put in place by the administrator. So you could always do this, um, but you had to check your database schema on each object and field before you um, either queried it or before you carried out any operations on it. Um, so you ended up with um, quite a lot of manual checks, quite a lot of if um, around. Um, so now, as you can see in the code snippets here, um, you can specify whether SOCL or DML executes in system or user mode using the new with user mode, with system mode and SOCL queries and the as whatever additional version of the DML statement. So that will come in very handy. ISVs will be particularly pleased to see this because they've been having to manually check everything to pass the security review. Um, so this brings us to the end of our features, but as always, um, there is a release readiness site where you can find the uh, the release notes, demo videos, release in a box, all sorts of other things. Um, and once you've been through that material, you'll be in good shape to tackle the trailhead badge. Um, so this really does bring us to the end of the webinar. I'm just gonna jump over to the controls and see if we have any questions. And it appears that we don't. Great, so obviously everybody understands everything they need to understand. If you do think of any questions, please feel free to reach out, um, info at brightgen.com, uh, or if you're a service customer or uh, uh, one of our customers, talk to um, so if your service manager or account executive. Um, aside from that, um, thanks very much for joining me. Um, not the same without Clive, but somehow we press on. Um, and I hope to see you all at the uh, Winter 22 webinar, which will, well, sorry, Winter 23 webinar, that'll be, that should be around October time. So hopefully see you all in a few months. Thanks very much, everyone. Catch you all later.